Spine Fellowship at the Beth Israel Medical Center. He's a board certified neurosurgeon. He has a background in both neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgical management. So that combination has uh, has uh, propelled him through his career. Uh, he's widely regarded as a as a patient centric doctor and uh, an important asset in our department. And he's going to present to us today uh, on syringal myelia and the management of that condition. Thanks, Peter. Um... Good morning, everyone. Um, I got to check to see here if I got the right screen uh, shared. Um, how does that look? Are you able to see? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, at Grand Rounds. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a topic that I've had a great interest for many years and that's the neurosurgical management of syringomyelia. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with defining syringomyelia and related terminology or nomenclature. Uh, then I'm gonna discuss different forms of syringomyelia uh, and their causes and presentations. I'll speak briefly about medical treatment and options. And then finally, I will uh, review surgical cases that will highlight various aspects of syringomyelia and hopefully impart some uh, surgical decision-making. I have no disclosures. So the MRIs uh, on the right show extensive syringomyelia of the cervical spine in a patient. Uh, the word syringomyelia was created by Charles Prosper Olivier, a French pathologist who in 1827 saw these tubular fluid-filled cavities uh, within the spinal cord of stillborn pathologic specimens. Uh, these specimens also had meningocele's and spina bifida. He took the uh, word syrinx from the Greek language, which refers to tube and malio referring to spine marrow. And he combined the two to form the word syringomyelia. In Greek mythology, Syrinx was a beautiful nymph who was pursued by Pan, the Greek god of the wilderness. Syrinx ran to the river's edge and pleaded for the, the river nymphs to help her. The nymphs cast a spell upon Syrinx and turned her into a hollow reed. She was indistinguishable from the other reeds along the river. Pan could not see Syrinx any longer and became frustrated and his breath sent a wind through the reeds producing a beautiful sound. Uh, Pan took several of these reeds and made a musical uh, tubular instrument, uh, sometimes called the Syrinx or the Pipes of Pan. So we'll transition uh, approximately 200 years forward from Charles Prosper Olivier days where the diagnosis of syringomyelia was made by post-mortem uh, analysis to the modern day uh, where syringomyelia is now diagnosed radiographically uh, using MRIs on living individuals. Um, so these fluid filled cavities uh, have very terminology in the radiologic literature uh, which may include syringomyelia, hydromyelia, or combinations of the words including syringohydromyelia, uh, which can be used interchangeably and sometimes this causes some confusion. So for the purposes of this talk, hydromyelia, which is seen here on the left, refers to a benign remnant of a central canal. Uh, on cross-sectional view, um, you could see it appears as round, it's central in location. On sagittal view, it can have a fusiform or spindle shape. Hydromyelia does not widen the diameter of the spinal cord and is usually less than three millimeters in dimension. Uh, this is a benign anatomic variant and it's not a surgical problem. This is to be distinguished from the images on the right panel, uh, which shows a syrinx, which is a distended cavity. Um, 
And these cavities can be eccentric and irregular. Uh, the cavities oftentimes are uh, greater than five millimeters in diameter. Uh, the cavities are usually expansile. They can enlarge the uh, cord and sometimes they enhance uh, with gadolinium. Symptoms from syringomyelia will develop depending on the part of the spinal cord where the cavity is located. Most syrinxes are in the cervical spine cord. Um, in this uh, netter diagram, the top two images on the right show different syrinx cavities. When the syrinx expands into the spinal parenchyma, uh, especially into the gray matter, patients may develop weakness, atrophy, and potentially sensory changes to the arms and hands. Neuropathic pain is very common. When the syrinx expands into the white matter, long track signs can develop and patients may have uh, lower extremity weakness or difficulty walking. This slide shows some other neurologic findings that may accompany syringomyelia. There is the classic uh, dissociated sensory loss, which is described in neuroanatomy textbooks as a loss of pain and temperature sensation, but a preservation of light touch, vibration and position sense. Um, and this typically occurs as a result in a cervical syrinx. Um, the distribution of a patient's pain and sensory disturbances uh, is oftentimes found in a cape-like distribution. Um, I've seen patients in the office who've come to me with severe burns in their upper extremity due to a loss of temperature sensation. Patients may also get a Horner syndrome, uh, and this is uh, caused by disruption in sympathetic pathway uh, at the level of the intermediolateral gray cells. Syringobulbia is a term used when the cavitation uh, involves the lower brainstem. Symptoms may involve the lower cranial nerves. Uh, this can uh, be seen by tongue weakness, facial numbness, or vocal cord problems. So as we had discussed, dysesthetic or neuropathic pain is very common and it occurs in approximately 40% of patients with syringomyelia. The pain is usually um, distributed in a segmental uh, area with dysesthesias. Patients may describe burning, hyperesthesia, and sometimes these are associated with trophic skin changes. Um, this neuropathic pain is oftentimes ascribed to a loss of nociceptive and lamiscal pathways. The syrinx pain uh, appears similar to the pain that's seen in patients with spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, or other intramedullary tumors, uh, which have a central pain uh, syndrome. Studies uh, from patients who have syrinxes have revealed that those who have irregular uh, syrinx cavities oftentimes have a poorer prognosis in pain control. So the epidemiology of uh, syringomyelia, the uh, National Organization uh, for Rare Disorders estimates that in the U.S. syrinxes account for about 8.4 uh, cases for every 100,000 individuals. Syringomyelia is usually diagnosed in individuals between 20 and 50 years. Um, there are many different causes for syringomyelia. The most common cause is Chiari malformation, and this accounts for about 60% of the cases. The other 40% of cases can sort of be lumped together uh, into the category, which I'll describe as primary syringomyelia. <clears throat> These are the cases of syringomyelia where the cause of the syrinx is believed to originate at the level of the spine rather than at the level of the cranial vertebral junction, which we know from Chiari malformations. Uh, primary syringomyelia uh, may occur from tethered cord syndromes, spinal arachnoiditis, 
Arachnoiditis may come about as a result of infection or hemorrhage. Uh, tumors of the spine can cause syrinx formation and also uh, direct spinal cord trauma. Sometimes the cause of the syrinx is unclear. In these cases, we, we term idiopathic. So uh, the term Chiari malformation is named after the Austrian pathologist, Hans Chiari, who first described them in 1891. He originally described four types of malformations in autopsy specimens. The vast majority of cases that we will see in our medical practice are going to be of the type one malformation uh, type. Chiori one type one malformation is understood to be a hindbrain anomaly with the cerebellar tonsils descending below the foramen magnum. Some cases of Chiori malformation are thought to be related to a morphometrically small posterior cranial frassa. What's interesting is that some types of Chiari 1 malformation produce syrinxes, and yet others may not have an associated syrinx. So this remains an area of active research and investigation. Chiari malformations uh, create symptoms by uh, three main mechanisms. Um, Chiaris uh, can cause direct neural compression where the tonsils uh, exert mass effect on the upper uh, cervical cord and medulla. The uh, tonsils can also uh, block the flow of CSF across the cranial vertebral junction. Um, and then finally, in a subset of patients with Chiari, uh, malformation. Um, some patients may have symptoms related to instability uh, at this cranial vertebral junction. Um, our current understanding of the pathophysiology of syrinx formation is uh, largely based on the work of Ed Oldfield and Karen Marasco and John Heiss uh, when they were at the NIH. Um, there they had studied the flow of CSF uh, during the cardiac cycle uh, in normal patients compared with uh, Chiari uh, 1 patients. So in the normal cardiac cycle, we know that systolic blood causes uh, the brain to temporarily expand um, because of the increased blood volume across a fixed uh, intracranial space. Uh, the, this blood expansion uh, then causes uh, CSF to be displaced and to flow into the spinal compartment. Now, in a Chiari patient, um, as seen here on the left diagram, the cerebellar tonsils uh, behave uh, what's been described as like a piston, uh, and it causes obstruction at the level of the frame and magnum. Uh, causing uh, also uh, a subarachnoid stenosis where the uh, CSF is not able to flow through this area. So the pulsations through the cardiac cycle, systole, diastole, leads to increased spinal fluid pressure in the, uh, across a, a closed spinal compartment. And it's believed that this increased pressure drives the CSF into these perivascular spaces, uh, which we uh, call virchow robin spaces. Um, a similar mechanism uh, appears to be involved um, for cases of primary syringomyelia, uh, where uh, it's been shown that partial blocks at the subarachnoid level uh, may lead to uh, the CSF pulsations driving uh, fluid inside the spinal cord. And as the fluid accumulates, there's a parenchymal breakdown, further facilitating propagation and enlargement of the syrinx. So I, I found this video clip uh, from Ed Oldfield's paper in the Neurosurgery Journal article in September 2017, 
And I thought it would be interesting for you to hear from Ed Oldfield himself describing the pathophysiology of syrinx formation using an intraoperative ultrasound. Uh, I hope you can hear it well. Let's see. The patient is a 19-year-old with syringomyelia extending from his lower thoracic region up into the upper cervical portion of his spinal cord. He is in position for surgery here. And as we begin the intraoperative ultrasound, the posterior lip of the frame of magnum and the arch of C1 have been removed. The ultrasound probes at the top here. The dura is indicated by the yellow arrow. The anterior and posterior surfaces of the spinal cord are shown by the white arrows and the asterisk is in the syrinx. We initially see that there is prominent pulsations. This suggested to us, at least initially, that Gardner was probably right. As we continue to watch the video, when the tonsils come into view and we carefully inspect what is happening with the syrinx, with the downward pulsation of the tonsils with each heartbeat, we see that the upper pole of the syrinx is being compressed, not expanded. Of course, we do not see the lower pole of the syrinx, which will be expanded as the upper pole is being compressed. When we then look at the spinal cord in the transverse view, we can also see the prominent systolic compression of the upper pole of the syrinx. When this is re-examined after the dura, but not the arachnoid, is opened, those pulsations have dramatically reduced in amplitude. And this has occurred when the steps necessary for successful treatment of the syrinx have taken place. Notice that now, and only now, does the syrinx expand during forced inspiration. All right, thanks, Dr. Oldfield. So, some famous individuals uh, have suffered from syringomyelia, uh, just to name two, Roseanne Cash, as you know, is a famous uh, songwriter and composer who uh, has syringomyelia associated with Chiari malformation. Uh, in her memoirs, she describes a 10-year ordeal of pain being misdiagnosed with migraine headaches and then cluster headaches uh, before she had the proper diagnosis. She ultimately uh, underwent uh, surgical correction. Um, her case uh, demonstrates how syringomyelia and Chiari may be challenging to diagnose. Bobby Jones is perhaps one of the most famous individuals with syringomyelia. He is considered one of the greatest American amateur golfers of all time, having won 13 uh, majors, including golf's Grand Slam. Uh, Bobby Jones's syringomyelia was thought to be caused by a freak traumatic accident in 1929. Uh, he was later diagnosed at the age of 46 by CT myelogram. Um, he continued uh, after the age of 46 and uh, suffered severe pain and progressive paralysis. His case highlights the oftentimes uh, progressive and painful course of syringomyelia. So the pain from syringomyelia may arise from nociceptive or neuropathic causes. Uh, the picture here shows another component of how uh, the syrinx can cause denervation of joints, in this case, Charcot joints, um, at the, including shoulder Charcot joints. Uh, this is estimated to occur in about 6% of patients with cervical syringomyelia. So there are uh, different uh, pain medications uh, that may be offered to patients with neuropathic pain. Uh, these medication can uh, be used with uh, varying degrees of success. Uh, common ones used uh, would be gabapentin, tricyclic antidepressants, and uh, Lyrica. So now I'm going to shift uh, gears 
Um, and I'm going to uh, present a series of uh, cases uh, which are going to highlight uh, sort of the surgical treatment of syringomyelia. Um, there are quite a few cases. I think there are 14, and this is sort of the second half of the talk. Um, so the first case is a nurse who presented in 2010 with a symptomatic Chiari malformation and a new syrinx, which had not been seen on a prior MRI uh, three years earlier. She had presented with the classic Valsalva-induced headaches, she had neck stiffness and upper extremity paresthesias. Um, interestingly here, you'll see the radiologist report, which described her cervical spine MRI to have cerebellar, quote, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia that was not sufficient to be described as Chiari-1 malformation. Um, you know, the current uh, definition of Chiari malformation has evolved to be a somewhat uh, arbitrary radiologic guideline of five millimeters uh, tonsillar herniation below the frame and magnum. This was established in Barkovich's uh, article in the American Journal of Neuroradiology in 1986. However, this case sort of highlights how we cannot rely exclusively on the radiology interpretation, but we need to include the full clinical presentation to make the formal diagnosis. So in this case, I recommended a, a posterior fossa decompression. Um, you can see this is the, uh, the approach, um, which included a suboccipital craniectomy, a C1 laminectomy, um, an opening of the dura with lysis of arachnoid adhesions, uh, a tonsillar reduction was performed, and a duroplasty. So she uh, very early on experienced resolution of her Valsalva induced headaches. Uh, and at three months post op, uh, you can see uh, that the syrinx improved nicely. However, there's been a lot of controversy uh, in the field of uh, patients with Chiari malformations and syringomyelia. This controversy uh, is in part related to the heterogeneity of the Chiari condition. Uh, not all Chiaris are the same. Uh, and for a whole variety of reasons, there could be skull-based abnormalities. Uh, some patients may have connective tissue disorders. Some uh, patients have syringomyelia, others do not. So there's, there's a, a large variance of uh, presentations uh, with patients with these conditions. Another uh, reason for the so-called variable outcomes is partly due to surgeon preference and surgeon training. Um, here are some uh, common surgical options. Uh, at the top here, it's the posterior fossa decompression or so-called extradural uh, removal of bone only and uh, leaving the dura intact. Sometimes there are some maneuvers, including scoring uh, of the dura. Um, and that, uh, that is a relatively popular uh, form. A more common one is the posterior fossa decompression with duraplasty. Um, and in addition, once the patient's uh, dura is open, there are a whole variety of other uh, intradural manipulations that can be potentially performed. This can include uh, bipolar coagulation of the tonsils, which causes them to ascend, or what I'll refer to as tonsillar reduction. Um, there are other uh, manipulations, which can include exploration of the fourth ventricle uh, and stenting. Uh, then there's Gardner's operation, which involves the uh, plugging of the obex. There's also uh, a large variance in if a pa patient undergoes duraplasty, what type of patch to use. There are autographs, allografts. Um, and finally, um, Sometimes uh, patients may need to undergo direct syrinx shunting. 
So uh, one of the major controversies is this ongoing debate about whether or not to open the dura uh, and to perform a duraplasty or to perform the less invasive surgery involving a bone decompression. Um, the differences in opinion are essentially related to a stratification uh, of different risks that may be involved. Um, so here you can see in figure one, the duraplasty procedure runs the risk of um, a postoperative complication of the development of a CSF leak or pseudomeningocele. Um, and this is in contrast to a patient who undergoes the posterior fossa decompression uh, without opening the dura. Uh, and here you can see in figure two, the uh, patient syrinx had never uh, improved, uh, but in fact, the syrinx had worsened and so required a return to the OR um, in order to open up the dura and uh, perform tonsil reduction and then subsequent duraplasty. So a major paper uh, for our understanding uh, of syrinx management was uh, published this year uh, in the July 2022 issue of the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. It was the first large-scale multi-center study uh, to compare the outcomes and complications um, in patients undergoing posterior fossa decompression, and the two cohorts were with and without duraplasty. Um, the study was done uh, by the um, Park Reeves uh, Research Consortium, uh, which is a big uh, group amongst at least 42 um, pediatric institutions throughout the country. Um, and the study uh, analyzed prospective and retrospective outcomes uh, in 692 patients. Um, the average age of these patients was 9.86 years old, and the mean follow-up was uh, a good 2.73 years. Um, the, uh, what's of interest uh, is that the posterior fossa decompression, in other words, the extradural de uh, decompression showed a shorter OR time, less blood loss, and shorter hospital stay. And there was a, uh, a relatively small 13.7 six month uh, complication rate, but this was balanced with a uh, need for a eight, approximately 18% uh, revision rate. Um, this was to be contrasted with the duraplasty group, which revealed that these patients had uh, a better clinical outcome, uh, meaning they had a greater reduction radiographically in their syrinx and a greater improvement in headache and back pain. Um, but these better outcomes was um, sort of balanced with a higher 24.3% uh, six-month post-op complication. Um, these patients uh, did not require as many revisions. So these are rather sobering statistics. Um, I, I, I think it, it reflects the reality of uh, our current practice and you know, the new data is very helpful uh, for us to better risk stratify and to counsel our patients. Um, going on to some other uh, cases, um, this uh, case shows us uh, how uh, a syrinx should not be considered a static entity and that it can, in fact, uh, reaccumulate or recur again in a delayed manner. So the patient had undergone a posterior fossa decompression for this large syrinx, as you could see, and postoperatively, uh, six months afterwards, you could see the syrinx uh, had improved. Uh, patient was doing well, but two and a half years after the initial surgery, uh, the patient's uh, symptoms uh, recurred again. 
um, and the patient was brought back to the OR and a posterior fossa revision was performed with intradural lysis of adhesions, uh, as well as uh, a revision duroplasty. And you could see here, um, the patient's uh, syrinx had improved again. This is um, an interesting uh, case, and it involves how uh, syringal mylea can present in a rather rapid uh, fashion. In this case report, uh, a 29-year-old female patient had undergone eight years prior uh, uncomplicated posterior fossa decompression and uh, placement of VP shunt for treatment of hydrocephalus, Chiari malformation, and syringomyelia. She had been doing well, but then wasn't feeling well. She started to develop uh, headaches again, progressive paraparesis, uh, and then a new MRI you could see here in the middle panel showed that she was developing a acute hydrocephalus uh, of all four ventricles. And you could see there's a, a secondary tonsillar herniation and then the development of a large cervical syrinx. Um, so the patient was taken to the OR and what was found was uh, that she had a failure of the VP shunt which was subsequently revised. And after the revision, you could see how the syrinx uh, collapsed nicely. Um, so this is case 3A. Um, it's a similar case. Um, I, I'm presenting this sort of as uh, to emphasize the point. Um, even though this patient did not have any prior treatment, um, the patient's presenting with a new diagnosis of new hydrocephalus, tonsillar herniation, and syringomyelia. Um, and it's important to treat the hydrocephalus first. This is uh, important for the residents to know uh, for their boards. Um, this case is from the Japanese literature, and it shows uh, tandem areas of stenosis. Uh, so the subarachnoid stenosis is a, potentially occurring at the level of the foramen magnum or uh, in the subaxial cervical spine. So the Japanese group uh, decided to do just a cervical laminoplasty, and you could see that the syrinx had improved um, and the patient did not need a subsequent posterior fossa decompression. So this last case sort of shows us how the goal of uh, surgery should be to identify, localize, and relieve the CSF block. Um, the syringomyelia is in many ways a symptom of subarachnoid stenosis. Um, the preferred treatment uh, should be directed at eliminating the CSF obstruction uh, whether it's coming from an arachnoiditis or uh, spinal tethering or an extrinsic factor such as disc or intrinsic factor like a, a tumor. Uh, sometimes uh, the syrinx is not amenable uh, for direct treatment and uh, shunting uh, is, can be used as a treatment of last resort. So this is a case uh, that uh, Dr. Gatan uh, allowed me to present here. Uh, thanks, Adi. It's an interesting one. Uh, in this case, a uh, 20-year-old uh, male had a history of previous lipomyelomeningocele uh, repair that was done at five months of age. Um, and he had been uh, living uh, well, but then a few months prior to his presentation, uh, he started to de uh, develop some ascending neurologic complaints with paresthesias and some uh, weakness. Uh, when he was imaged, uh, what was found was a small Chiari malformation. He had a low-lying uh, spinal cord with tethering and a sacral lipoma. Successful treatment here involved only performing uh, 
a sequel laminectomy and detethering of the spinal cord with debulking of the intraspinal lipoma. Um, no posterior fossa decompression uh, was required and the syrinx uh, resolved nicely. So Dr. Gatan's case underscores the importance of performing a full neuraxis MR imaging. Uh, and this MR imaging should include the base of the skull, uh, oftentimes to try to understand the extent of where the syrinx may be and to look for areas where uh, could be the cause of the syrinx, uh, syrinx formation. Sometimes the MR uh, doesn't reveal uh, where the syringomyelia may be coming from. And CT myelogram, I found, can oftentimes be helpful in delineating areas of CSF blockage. This is a, uh, another case of a 54-year-old female patient who presented with lower extremity spasticity. Uh, her MRI uh, showed a rather large uh, syrinx involving the distal end of the cord, uh, conus level. Uh, she was taken to the OR and underwent a T12 L1 laminectomy, intradural exploration, uh, cyst fenestration. Uh, we did a small biopsy and also section the phylum terminale. The, uh, the path came back as a benign uh, gliopendomal cyst. And you can see here, um, there was nice resolution of the syrinx. This is a interesting case of a gentleman who had come from overseas. He uh, had a remote history of uh, thoracic shingles and he was presenting with uh, a mid thoracic syrinx. Um, and he went to Singapore first um, and he had undergone uh, a lumbar laminectomy and the neurosurgeon performed the sectioning of the phylum terminale. Uh, but unfortunately, that intervention did not resolve the syrinx. Um, and uh, so what had happened was he, he came to the States, uh, we reviewed his case and we decided to do uh, an intradural exploration at the level of where the uh, syrinx was. And this was accomplished by doing thoracic laminectomy. Uh, and what we found were arachnoidal adhesions. The cord was untethered. Uh, no duroplasty was performed. He had some improvement in his uh, sort of mid thoracic uh, dysesthesias, but he still complained of distal lower extremity uh, dysesthesias, which were actually quite significant. So this case is important to review with the patient. It highlights how some symptoms may improve, uh, but it's also highly likely that the, some patient symptoms may still remain. And so it's important in counseling them that surgery is performed to prevent progression and oftentimes to stabilize the condition. This is a case of a 61-year-old female who uh, presented with gait instability, ascending uh, neurologic uh, complaints. Uh, you can see here, um, there's no clear tonsillar herniation, no Chiari malformation, but a rather large cervical thoracic syrinx. Um, unclear wh where her, um, her subarachnoid stenosis may be. So we performed a CT myelogram and that helped to delineate a partial subarachnoid myelographic block at the distal end of the syrinx. Um, this uh, CT myelogram finding uh, reveals uh, what has been described in radiology as the scalpel sign uh, because it appears as though there's a scalpel on its side uh, where the myelogram uh, dye accumulates. 
Uh, and this is usually indicative of a, the presence of a, an arachnoid web or adhesion. So she underwent uh, thoracic laminectomy, lysis of adhesions, and you can see here she had a good response with some reduction of the syrinx, but not a complete um, uh, collapse of the syrinx cavity. Um, this is another case of uh, sort of a focal uh, arachnoiditis uh, presentation in a 54-year-old tennis instructor. Um, you may have seen this in other presentations I gave last year, but it's uh, important to note in this context what we had tried the CT myelogram, but it did not show the classic scalpel sign. Despite that, he was experiencing progression in his neurologic symptoms. So he underwent the thoracic laminectomy. And this is, uh, we saw intraoperatively in the ultrasound, uh, you could see the presence of these arachnoid webs. Uh, when the dura was opened, uh, there's this large, uh, arachnoid scar, if you will, which was resected, the cord was uh, detethered, and afterwards, radiologically, there was good response, and he was able to go back to teaching tennis. So there's, there's really a, a little amount of information in the uh, literature about long-term outcomes, uh, about the surgical uh, treatment of these arachnoid cysts and webs in the, uh, in the thoracic spine. Um, I'm working uh, currently with several of the other faculty members in our department uh, who I reached out to, and I'm, I'm happy this is sort of uh, canvassing for anyone else within our department to try to put together a review of the 10-year experience at Sinai. Um, an IRB has already been submitted, um, but we're, we are just awaiting one attending who will go unnamed to finish his CITI course recertification so that we could move forward. Uh, many thanks to Matt Carr uh, for helping with this IRB and to Halima for pitching in when Matt was busy getting married. Um, this is a patient um, who had a history of fibromyalgia and also a remote history of Lyme meningitis. And she presented with this uh, focal a large expansile cervical syrinx. Uh, she underwent a syringo subarachnoid shunt and she had a good clinical and uh, radiographic response. Um, these shunts can be uh, technically demanding um, as you have to traverse uh, the cord in order, uh, you know, traverse spinal tissue in order to get the catheter into the syrinx cavity. And so there are some um, important um, surgical adjuncts, uh, especially neurophysiologic monitoring involving dorsal column stimulation to assist with these catheter uh, placements. Uh, there are a variety of different shunts that can be done, uh, including syringal pleural, peritoneal shunts. But these uh, shunts are, uh, have been found to have high uh, relatively high complication rates and poor long-term uh, outcomes. This is a paper from Dr. Ulrich Batzdorf, who has contributed uh, a great deal to the field of syringal myelia, and he reviewed um, his experience with shunts and, and uh, discussed how there can be a relatively high complication and failure rate. This is a case uh, that shows um, that treatment, surgical treatment is not always successful. Uh, this uh, was a case in a 55-year-old gentleman who had a prior history of significant subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that led to the development of significant arachnoiditis. Uh, what was done was uh, thoracic laminectomy. We tried the lysis of adhesions. Uh, but unfortunately, he didn't experience any clinical improvement. Um, I think this case shows what other uh, groups, uh, namely Dr. Heiss's group, uh, have published, was that when you're dealing with extensive arachnoiditis, especially with arachnoiditis with four or more levels, uh, this usually portends a, a worse prognosis.
Uh, the next two cases are about tumoral associated uh, syrinx. This was a 18-year-old uh, uh, female patient who, when she was five, she had a, a subtotal resection of a JPA uh, tumor. And she was coming uh, in with a recurrent tumor. And uh, here you could see the gadolinium enhancement. Uh, actually, let me go back. What was of interest is you could see how the syrinx in this um, skeletally immature uh, patient had caused bony uh, enlargement of the spinal canal. Uh, after resection of the recurrent astrocytoma, the syrinx collapsed, but you're left with the, uh, the larger syrinx, uh, sorry, you're left with the larger uh, bony canal that's there. She uh, subsequently underwent a whole variety of orthopedic uh, deformity procedures. Finally, um, another uh, tumor that has a well-known association uh, with syrinxes are intramedullary hemangioblastomas, which are known to form a sort of a exuberant edema or syrinx formation. After a section of these hemangioblastomas, the syrinx usually resolves. And finally, the last case, uh, syringomyelia uh, can be found in dogs, in several species of dogs. Um, this is an example of the Cavalier King Charles uh, Spaniel, who has a Chiari-like uh, malformation with tonsillar descent. And vets have been imaging uh, these dogs and have found the development of syrinxes. So in summary, uh, syringomyelia is not a disease entity in and of itself, but it's a pathologic condition common to a variety of disorders. A syrinx may form with partial blockage or stenosis of the subarachnoid space or damage to the spinal parenchyma. Common causes of syringomyelia disrupt CSF flow. These causes include Chiari malformation, arachnoiditis, trauma, or tumors. And syrinx evaluation should include an MRI uh, extending from the skull base to the entire spine. Occasionally, CT myelogram may be helpful. There are some uh, medications that may be helpful for neuropathic pain. That's common with patients with syringomyelia. Surgery is a good option in some select cases. Successful surgical treatment targets the appropriate mechanism of syrinx development. Thanks for listening. Um, just a shout out to our incredible neurosurgery team here on the west side. Here on the left, the team is being rather goofy with their hard hats on and then uh, normal without the hats on. Uh, today is an exciting day. Uh, because we are moving uh, and officially going live um, at 787 11th Avenue. Um, not sure if we have any time for uh, questions or comments. Thanks, Shan. That was a really nice talk, and I think it it really illustrates the complexity of syringomyelia and patients with it. Um, as you showed really well, it's a it's a shape shifter, and it can be hard to track down the underlying cause. I was hoping you could comment on the patient um, where you really hit a dead end. You know, there's no Chiari, there's no tethered cord, there's no arachnoid cyst, there's no ventral cord herniation, tumor, and you're just left with a huge syrinx with no clear etiology. How do you approach counseling those patients and considering treatment? Yeah, so are you saying it's, this is one of the patients that I happen to show during my uh, talk, no, 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 talking just about the, like a uh, like new patient sitting in the office. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think uh, in that context, the so called idiopathic um, syrinx, uh, you have to sort of gauge is the syrinx causing symptoms? Is there progressive enlargement? I think you could certainly argue for, especially if you're seeing radiographically. Uh, progression and enlargement of the syrinx uh, to potentially do a um, 
a intradural exploration. Now there, there are entities such as a, which I didn't go into in this talk, but there's something called a Chiari Zero, which was described by Dr. Oakes and Dr. Iskinder. And in, in their series, they had a group of patients who had a cervical syrinx without any clear, no tonsillar herniation at all. Uh, but the syrinx was just proximate um, in the cervical area. They went ahead, they did a posterior fossa decompression, intradural exploration, and they found things what are described as like arachnoid veils. And they, um, after they did their surgery, those syrinxes improved. So it, it, it definitely speaks to the controversy um, in this field and, and the, uh, the differences in presentation. Thanks. We have Chan, any other questions? I have, a, I have a question, Chen. First of all, thank you for the great talk and your thoughtful leadership on this area. Um, for these intradural procedures, as you know and pointed out, they're fraught with sometimes recurrent tethering and other issues. Do you have any comments on strategies at surgery related to the path to itself, the suture technique, or um, barriers to try and reduce retethering and arachnoid issues down the road? Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, I think that that's a great point. One of the strategies that I um, have tried my best is that before opening the dura you want to eliminate as much uh, hemorrhage or bleeding into the intradural space because the intervention of actually going in, whether it's doing the posterior fossa decompression, by having blood in the area, and it, it may be related to uh, the patient has uh, some, and, and there's research uh, related to this, is they, they may have like an exuberant way of uh, forming scars or, or forming arachnoiditis. So one of the um, matters is to try to prevent as much uh, bleeding intradurally and to be as meticulous as possible. Sometimes you could put uh, cotton pledgets above and below, um, you know, and, and to frame the area you're working in. The, um, the choice for uh, patches. I traditionally, I, I'll use uh, pericranium. Uh, and I think uh, the studies will show that uh, synthetics uh, may be at higher risk of developing, um, you know, whether it's aseptic meningitis or infections in general. Uh, it definitely adds to more work. Um, but I, I, I think overall, if you look at the literature, um, preparing autograft is, is probably better, but you know, a lot of, a lot of surgeons uh, have relied on different graphs and they, and they get good outcomes too. Hey Chan, very really nice talk. You know, Alejandro and I have been working with uh, scientists here, Dr. Mehmet Kurt, looking at some of the complex physiologies of Chiari's and the concept of compressibility and the morphometrics of the posterior fossa. And I think it, it's fascinating because we have a live physiologic state in which we see real, you know, variety of change. And I don't think we fully understand all the metrics that go into it. Just as you nicely outlined, there's so many clinical presentations. There's probably something that we can learn perhaps from the imaging ahead of time or something else, because it sort of feels like this is a common pathway phenomenon but we don't understand, you know, the ideologic mechanisms completely. So, you know, it's always been interesting to me for sure. I, I think Raj, I think one potential idea that would, because I know you have access to the 7D uh, magnet, um, rather the seven Tesla magnet. And I think what would be exciting is, I don't know if there are protocols that allow for uh, looking at the flow of CSF across the foramen magnum in sort of like preoperative patients and then compare them postoperatively and, and to try to gauge, you know, if there's uh, something more that we can learn preoperatively from these higher resolution MRIs. Um, you know, currently 
uh, I have adopted using an intraoperative ultrasound, that, but that's primarily to look at the space, if you will, um, that we are creating. And uh, perhaps if, if there's a way of looking ahead of time to try to screen patients, maybe it'll give us a better understanding whether or not a patient really needs a duroplasty. Uh, I don't know, just an idea. I think that's a great idea. You know, we're, we've been looking at amplified MRI where you actually, it's not a high field, it's not a 7T, but it's creating a small mm -hmm. vibrational change. And, um, you know, we're noticing real brain motion changes, but I think moving it to 7T would be great. Um, I just wanted to also tell you, Chan, you know, the idea, I, I routinely buzz the tonsil and shrink it. And it's something that I learned from you, actually, the time that we were together at Roosevelt. So um, I know you have a lot of experience. So yeah, yeah I, I, I I modified I, myself for you. <laughs> for <what> I, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, there are a lot of groups and I know uh, uh, what we're seeing is that if you're going to go through the risk of opening the dura. I think um, buzzing the tonsils will give you more space because space is a premium. And um, there's a relatively low downside to it. Um, there also have been some uh, sort of histologic studies on um, patients with uh, Chiari uh, who have shown that these tonsils are histologically malformed. They're not, they're not normal tissue as they were anyway. So, cause there's always a concern. Are you, uh, causing harm by coagulating what, uh, may, uh, be believed to be a normal tissue? Um, but I, I, I think it, it's, it's becoming more widely popularized is the tonsillar reduction. I'm interested to see how practice patterns evolved after that Park Reeve study was published, um, because I think a lot, it, it's shown us a lot, but it also had some pretty significant limitations. You know, the, the trial centers, that the patients were not randomized into duroplasty or no, the trial centers were. So patients could be enrolled into the study, um, but, you know, one center was a duroplasty center and another center was a non-duroplasty center. So it sort of selected for the strength of the center um, in some ways, which can confound the results. But I think they're the strongest evidence that we have in selecting treatment for these patients. Yeah, the, I think the Park Rees group has contributed greatly to our understanding. They've, they've actually published some other papers uh, regarding like ventral compression and uh, the need or, or not need for um, occipital cervical fusion and some parameters uh, such as CXA, which is uh, somewhat helpful in trying to understand whether or not a patient would preemptively uh, need an OC fusion. But this is in the pediatric population, but I think in part, some of that information can be ported over to adults. Do we have any other questions from the participants? All right, well, thank you, Chan. It was a great talk and a, and a nice thank discussion. You.